Hi, I'm Chef Robin, and today's Hands in the Kitchen workshop is about inflammation. So today we want to discuss inflammation and how it affects the senior demographic because it's all in the news now. You can't really go anywhere without hearing about inflammation, but it's kind of a confusing thing that a lot of people don't understand. So uh, just to let you know, even in my Sunday newspaper, in my little parade that came on Sunday, there was a short article on fighting inflammation with food. So even in this past Sunday paper right there. So also at the grocery store on the checkout aisle, a nice eating well anti-inflammation magazine and eating to beat inflammation. So it's definitely something that people are talking about, wondering about how to deal with it, if they've got it. So we're going to kind of go through some questions and answer them hopefully and uh, take care of some of that misunderstanding that's out there. First we're going to talk about the two different kinds of inflammation because of course nothing is either or, there's always a group of something to discuss. So first there's acute inflammation and what is that actually? Is it healthy? Is it unhealthy? Chronic inflammation, you can kind of tell by that word chronic that that is unhealthy. We're going to find out why. Uh, and because it is the unhealthy one, that's the one we're going to be talking about. Uh, what are the causative factors of chronic inflammation? Signs and symptoms of chronic inflammation. And then how food hurts or heals. How food can help us deal if we have chronic inflammation how food might lead us to a situation of chronic inflammation. So that's a control issue that we can deal with, food. And then because this is a food workshop, we're going to talk about menu modifications that might meet some of those anti-inflammatory needs. So if we go back to the very beginning, we're going to talk about inflammation being the way that the body responds to infection and injury. This is a healthful thing that your body does. It uses the immune system, which is just like the nervous system or the circulatory system or the skeletal system. The immune system is a complex body in our own body that takes it upon itself to help us ward off disease, trauma, inflammation. So uh, the immune system will release white blood cells to fight off invading pathogens. An invading pathogen is a little bacteria, a microorganism that can cause disease. An infection is the growth of those germs or bacteria in our body. So our immune system is helping us deal with those situations. In acute inflammation, that's a very short-term healing situation. That's when you stub your toe or hit your funny bone or take out a splinter your body immediately starts to deal with that situation. You'll feel a little pain. The nerve receptors are going, ooh, ooh, something happened, they're stimulated. You'll feel a little heat because your blood vessels start to dilate and become larger with all those white healing blood cells coming in. You'll get some redness because of those blood cells dilating and you couldn't see some swelling. You may see some bruising along with redness, heat, and pain. But acute inflammation, which is dealing with those kind of issues of slight wounds or strep throats or otherwise, usually occurs in three to five days. You may have a bruise for a month, but the addressing, that health addressing by the body is usually taking place in three to five days. And it's a healthy thing that happens. So. The situation when it becomes chronic is when your body misfires those chemical helpful agents, those white blood cells, and starts mistakenly trying to heal healthy blood tissue. When it tries to heal healthy blood tissue, what happens is that it recognizes it as unhealthy tries to heal it, 
it's already healthy, it traumatizes that healthy blood tissue to where now it is unhealthy, and this cycle just keeps happening. So it's difficult to understand exactly <coughs> what that means, but we're going to go into kind of what the triggers are, why it does happen, what it means exactly, why it keeps on happening, and it's systemic and chronic and doesn't end. So it can last, you can have long-term inflammation that's going on for years, being this vicious cycle of healthy tissue, tissue being mistakenly tried to be healed turning it into unhealthy tissue that's just going on and on. Your body is not getting the signal to stop. Your body is getting the signal to heal, but it's kind of overflowing with this healing that's just going on and on. So you might recognize it as having a persistent pain that won't go away, no matter what you do, whether you do exercise, whether you do being gay, you have this persistent pain that just will not be relieved. You might recognize it as being tired all the time. These are kind of vague sort of symptoms. They can be applied to a lot of different things. One thing also is every little bug that's coming around, every little virus, every little flu, every little 24 hour whatever, you're the person that gets it. You cannot get your immune system to a place that it's strong enough to battle these frequent illnesses because it's seemingly dealing with this other trauma that's happening in your body. It thinks it's doing the right thing, but it's not. It's misfiring. Also, it can lead to serious digestive issues like irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's or acid reflex. You can have moodiness or anxiety when you have chronic inflammation. You can also gain weight. All of these things, in addition to being signs, they can also be prompters. So if you are overweight, that can prompt your body to be in a state where chronic inflammation will happen. If you are overstressed, that can prompt your body to be in a state where over or chronic inflammation can happen. So it's really hard to know where the beginning and where the end is going to be. But we do want to work towards an end. We do want to work towards a place where chronic inflammation isn't an assumed process of aging. And it is now such an issue with seniors that there's even been a word that's termed inflammaging. <laughs> and this was uh, documented by a woman from the University of Florida who is the director of cardiac, um, I gotta check my notes, just one second. She is the director of integrative cardiology and prevention at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and she is Dr. Monica Agarwal. And she came up with this term because seniors seem to be prone candidates for chronic inflammation. So let's talk about why that might be. <clears throat> It might be that as a senior, you have an acute inflammation situation that goes untreated. If every morning when you brush your teeth, there's some blood in the water, you may have a slight case of gingivitis, not deal with it, that can lead to a chronic inflammation situation. You may have an ingrown toenail that you don't deal with. Initially, it's something that your body through acute inflammation can help you heal, but if you don't start the healing process, it can go farther and become chronic. Also, if you have an autoimmune disorder like lupus or Lyme's, nobody really has control over getting bitten by a Lyme tick. That's out of our control. But if you end up with an autoimmune disorder, which kind of makes your immune system already depressed, that leads you to be a candidate for chronic inflammation. If you are exposed to toxins on a regular basis, say you lived in Flint, Michigan, where the water was so bad and people were drinking lead, or if you were a child that grew up around lead paint, or if you had a work experience with a lot of pesticides or chemicals, 
This can also lead you to a situation that toxic or chronic inflammation can occur. If you smoke, oh my gosh, that is like such a precursor to chronic inflammation. There is chemicals in smoking, even with the new lowest tar, zero tar cigarettes, it still triggers this response in your body that leads you to chronic inflammation. If you overdo with alcohol, all of these things that we know are not good for us set us up as candidates for chronic inflammation. If you are constantly under stress, the chemicals that your body sends out when you're constantly under stress are sending also messages to your brain, heal me, heal me, and starts this chronic situation of inflation. Sugar. If you mess around with the sugar in your diet and you consume or overload on white sugar, changing that balance of good bi gut biome, again, it's going to lead you to being a candidate for chronic inflammation. Sleepiness or tiredness also. So, so many of these things kind of fall in the same ballpark. And then this one right here, which we actually do have a level of control over, is one of the biggest culprits for chronic inflammation. Food with more than four items on the label five items at the most on the label are usually foods that you should be avoiding because after the first five you get down to things that were just created in a chemistry lab that your body may recognize as being sweet or salty or really tasty and wanting and wanting and wanting but doesn't recognize as something healthy and so it charges in to attack that leading to chronic inflammation so, <clears throat> we want to talk about this right here that we do have control over and how we can kind of lead ourselves away from a poor food diet to a healthier food diet. You're going to see a lot of familiar products up here because I talk about these superfoods almost every workshop we do. Today we're going to talk about superfoods that specifically address through their chemical agents inflammation. We want to look now at the top 10 anti-inflammatory foods. All foods have some anti-inflammatory agents to them. These are just the top 10 that if I could encourage you to include them in the diet over and above anything else, I would encourage you to include these foods. So olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, Leafy dark greens, we know they're full of iron, we know they're full of fiber. Vitamin C foods are healthy for us as far as anti-inflammatory foods. The cruciferous vegetables are healthy for us. They also give us a lot of fiber and nutrients. Fatty fish with the omega-3s that we were talking about. Omega-3s are even in Brussels sprouts and walnuts. So there is a food source for omega-3s that's very healthy if you're a vegan or a plant-forward person and not really a fish person. But tuna, pretty inexpensive protein in the grocery store. Great to have in your cupboard, but also on your salad. Green tea, if you're a caffeinated drinker, green tea is the way to go if you think you are a candidate for inflammation. Include vitamin A foods in your diet, nuts and seeds in your diet, zinc containing foods in your diet, lentils and tofu contain zinc. All of these agents, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin C, the iron and greens, <clears throat> the fats in extra virgin olive oil, all of these agents have more anti-inflammatory factors so that when you consume a diet that's forward in these kind of products, it tends to leave your balance greater in the area of anti-inflammatories than pro-inflammatories. So unless you are a candidate with lupus or Lyme's disease, chronic inflammation is generally thought of as a lifestyle disease because there are things that are within your ability to address 
that can combat chronic inflammation. And the first management step that anybody is going to recommend to you is eating that rainbow. We love that word, eating a rainbow. There were studies done on the world's healthiest people. They live in Acaria, Greece. They live in Japan. They live in Utah. They're Mormons, Latter-day Saints. And what all of them had in common, not that they were eating the same food, not that they were eating the same food prepared the same way, but they were eating a very plant-forward diet. They were eating a plant-forward diet without addictive foods involved. Addictive foods that contain too much sugar, contain too much alcohol, contain too much caffeine. So if we want to think of eating that plant-forward diet and we want to rely on something, we can think about the Mediterranean diet or we can think about the DASH diet, which a lot of people are familiar with, which is the dietary approach to stop hypertension. Both really plant forward diets that are easy to follow. <clears throat> and using those diets <clears throat> and using what I knew about the top 10 anti-inflammatory foods, I just did a suggestion poster of how you might go through your day with ideas about what you might want to eat instead of other things that may not be as good for you. So say for breakfast, Granola and yogurt and berries. Blueberries we know, superfood. Granola usually has oats, superfood. Yogurt, probiotic food, great for you. Oatmeal and craisins, maple and almonds. Almonds we know, right up there with all the other superfoods. A bell pepper tofu scramble, if you want it to be savory. Don't be afraid of using tofu. Tofu scramble is like the easiest thing on earth. You dice up some peppers, maybe you throw in some cherry tomatoes, then you just take your tofu and mash it as if you were mashing up or whipping an egg. Saute it in a little olive oil, add a little salt and pepper, Tabasco if you like, and there you have a beautiful, bright, savory breakfast that's very healthy. Great way to start the day. Uh, for those of you that are able to drink orange juice, tolerate citrus, if orange juice is too sweet, Dilute it down with a little water. Still going to give you that vitamin C punch. Still going to enjoy it. Lunchtime, think about changing out your hamburger with a lot of fat, saturated fat, or any red meat for a lentil burger or a black bean burger. You can buy them now in the freezer section. They're not that expensive, really truly. It's not that expensive to eat healthy now. The grocery stores want your dollars. They're working hard to make it easier for you to do so. Um, kale chips are fun. If that's the way you want to have your kale or include kale in your salad or a dark leafy green, have some tuna fish, tomato soup, avocado toast. Buddha bowls. Buddha bowls are a really fun thing, a really fun name for a bowl that has a grain, usually some type of bean, and then some raw things going with it, maybe a little salad dressing of your choice. Seriously, these are not difficult things to put together now because every grocery store has vegetables that are already cut up and diced for you, microwavable or five minute rices, quinoas, of all varieties, you can even get brown rice, basmati rice, that will cook in five minutes. If you can boil water, you can make a grain. It's really not difficult to do. And I am a big proponent of canned beans. Canned beans usually have canned beans, and sometimes they have salt. Two items, and I always rinse mine under running water in the sink because I don't want any more salt in them, but they're already cooked chickpeas, garbanzo beans, black beans, kidney beans. You can find all of them. Often they're 10 for 10 on sale. So it's not an issue of cost. It's not an issue of preparing. Lots of seniors have uh, can openers that they all they have to do is put the can right there. And it goes around for them. There you got it. Complete protein with a grain and a bean. If we move on to dinner, Dinner is definitely not hard either, okay? Fatty fishes are there already prepared at the grocery store sometimes for you. 
You could buy a four ounce filet of salmon, have part of it for dinner, flake the rest of it into an omelet the next morning or on top of your salad. Any kind of fish, cod, mackerel, any of the fatty fishes, herring, sardines. You could poach yourself some chicken, have it with some cruciferous vegetables. You can make yourself a basmati rice and chickpea bowl or a white bean and tomato fennel salad. And remembering these orange vegetables, remembering these green vegetables, eating a rainbow. Not that hard, guys. That's what you want to do. So, <clears throat> just to finish up, one of the reasons you want to go plant forward in directing your management against inflation, inflate. Inflation? Inflammation? Sorry. <laughs> Is that plants are a key source of antioxidants. Inflammation is an oxidizing situation in your body. We could go into all the chemistry of that, but just know that plants are anti-that. So we, and plants are the source of antioxidants. You're not going to buy a pound of hamburger meat and see on there that it says it's an antioxidant, because it's not. You're also not going to buy hamburger meat and see that you're getting fiber. It's not going to have that on there. It's not a source of fiber. Plants are the sole source you can have for soluble and non-soluble fiber. And why is fiber so important in addressing inflammation? Because fiber-rich diets have lower inflammatory factors. The lower you can keep your balance sheet of inflammatory factors, the better. Fiber is going to help you do that. Fiber also supports that healthier gut biome, which we all want, so that we don't get led down the road to Crohn's or irritable bowel syndrome. Fiber also helps to cut this connection, the obesity and the inflammation connection. Fiber helps us slow down our digestion so that it's easier to feel fuller for a longer period of time. Also, foods with fiber also tend to make us feel like we have eaten a nice amount of food rather than overloading on something like a bag of chips. All of a sudden, you're at the end because it feels like you ate nothing at all. So fiber is really seriously important in this battle. And then omega-3s, which also can be plant-based, like we talked about, walnuts and Brussels sprouts, slows the production of substances that are released in the inflammatory response. So there's a lot of stuff going on in your body. Food is one way that we can kind of have a little bit of a control of what goes on in our body, and we want to remember that and take that to heart. So you always want to seek balance in all parts of your life, but balance definitely in your diet. You want to compare the personal stressors that you have to your personal resources. So if you're personally stressed, say you're an insomniac who smokes and eats poorly, what are the personal resources that you can bring that are going to kind of balance that out? One could be to try and once a week eat healthier, twice a week eat healthier until it becomes more of a pattern of the way you eat. One could become more exercise before you have a bedtime routine. Maybe you need to take an evening stroll. If you use a walker, maybe it's just walking down the hallway before you get ready for bed. Somehow or other exercising, if you're totally under stress and that's why you're smoking, Maybe you need to consider yoga. Maybe you need to consider meditation. Maybe you need to consider just listening to a tape of nature sounds. And I know that sounds kind of cliche and like not really productive, but just try it. Challenge yourself to just try it, to take out some of those stressors and replace them with healthier resources that you can do and try to come to balance. It's not that difficult. You are in control. Nobody's going to put up 
a stop sign and say you can't eat healthier or you can't walk more or you can't do this or you can't do that. We want to be able to kind of be part of being healthy. We don't want it just to be laid at the feet of our physician or our caretakers. We actually want to be in charge ourselves. So, hopefully this cleared up a little bit of confusion about inflammation. Um, it is one of those kind of things that isn't really that easy to muddle through, but more often than not, if we want to sort of address these issues, it is in our power to do so. We just have to make a conscious and clear decision about it.